First of all, thank you so, so much for being here. Welcome. It's great to see such a strong audience turnout at our first OxBHR event of Hillary Term 2021. And we look forward to continuing to update you on our programming in the coming weeks. Uh, my name is Isabel Bernhard. I'm a master's candidate in Latin American studies at Oxford. And I'm one of the co-conveners of the OxBHR group together with Danilo, Lisa, Eleanor, and Katya. And it's our privilege today to be able to learn from Michael Santoro, Robert Shanklin, and Zane Rizvi, who I look forward to introducing in due course. Uh, I'll briefly run over the logistics of this event, which is slated to run from 4 p.m. GMT to 5.15 p.m. GMT. After this brief logistical overview, we'll go straight into the speakers back to back to back, and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A. Over the course of speaker uh, comments, you're more than welcome to drop your questions in the Q&A function in the chat, and we'll get to those right after the speakers finish. Uh, this event is being recorded, and it will be recorded up until the end of the last speaker comments. The Q&A is off the record. And following the recording, it will be processed and published on our website as well as on our Twitter. And we'll be dropping the links to those in the chat for you to view shortly. Uh, without further ado, let me launch into the bios of the people that we're very fortunate to have with us here today. Michael Santoro is co-founder and co-editor-in-chief of the Business and Human Rights Journal and the president of the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Association. Uh, among his published books is the co-edited volume, Ethics in the Pharmaceutical Industry, and he is professor of management and entrepreneurship at Santa Clara University in California. Uh, his colleague Robert Shanklin is a lecturer in the philosophy department at Santa Clara University. Robert's teaching and publications include Chinese philosophy, business ethics, aesthetics, and philosophy of language. He's advised firms based in Silicon Valley and elsewhere on business ethics in China. And Zane Rizvi is a law and policy researcher at Public Citizen, a Washington-based consumer advocacy organization. He has written widely on pharmaceutical innovation and access to medicines, including issues related to the coronavirus pandemic. Zane obtained a JD from Yale Law School, where he was student director of the Global uh, Health Justice Partnership. And with that, we'll turn it over to Robert. Cool. Thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss the human rights obligations of business, especially as regards uh, medicines like COVID-19 vaccines. Let me uh, share my screen. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. All right. I'm going to try and keep up with myself here. So this presentation is based closely on an article co-authored with my co-panelist Michael Santoro, uh, which has recently appeared in a special issue of the Journal of Human Rights on Human Rights in the Time of COVID-19 from November and December of last year. The, uh, the two questions we really wanna focus on today or that I'm gonna discuss are, do pharmaceutical corporations have human rights responsibilities to make medicines available to poor communities and particularly the global south? And if so, what gives them these responsibilities, but also what are their strengths? Are they uh, mere responsibilities as we might say, uh, shoulds or oughts, or are they more uh, strict like obligations? Our findings are that pharmaceutical companies do have obligations in the sense of being required not to interfere with member states' obligations to provide access to essential medicines. And this slide will give the bulk of the argument. Uh, step one is to look at the UN so-called Universal Declaration on Human Rights. I see universal because I spend a lot of time thinking about China. That's not a slight, just an observation. And the, the, there is a human right to medical care uh, in there. Next, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, uh, as many know probably informally as the Ruggy Principles. These were unanimously adopted by the UN Human Rights Council in 2011. And according to the Ruggy Principles, member states are obligated to protect and to remedy human rights uh, uh, violations in their jurisdictions, uh, according to principle one. And this includes violations by third parties such as businesses. And further, states must take appropriate steps to ensure through judicial, administrative, legislative, or other means that when such abuses occur within their territories and or jurisdictions, that those affected have access to effective remedy according to principle 25. The next step is that businesses are responsible to protect, uh, excuse me, responsible to respect, in particular to prevent and mitigate human rights violations. 
And so quoting again from the Ruggie principles, this means that they should avoid infringing on the human rights of others and should address human adverse human rights impacts with which they are involved, principle 11. Further, this responsibility, or more specifically, fulfilling this responsibility requires that businesses seek to prevent or mitigate adverse human rights impacts that are directly linked to their operations, even if they are not contributing to those impacts, principle 13b. Further commentary on these principles clearly indicates that the business responsibility for and the corollary requirement uh, not to prevent or mitigate uh, includes both actions and omissions, so a positive action that business might take, as well as something they might fail to do. Okay. The next step is to look at the uh, UN Human Rights Guidelines for Pharmaceutical Companies in relation to access to medicines, more commonly known as the Hunt Guidelines. These give structure to the human right to the highest attainable standard of health implicit in the Declaration and were submitted to the UN General Assembly in 2008. Uh, these predate the later Ruggie principles, but taken together uh, unequivocally establish the following, that member states are obligated to make EM essential medicines available to poor communities, including the global south. The World Health Organization defines EM as medicines that satisfy the healthcare needs of the population. They are intended to be available within the context of functioning health systems at all times and in adequate amounts in the appropriate dosage forms with assured quality and at a price the individual and the community can afford. And we take it as clear that COVID vaccines, but also others like HIV, AIDS, antiretrovirals, tuberculosis medicines, and so on, will fit the definition of essential medicines. The next step is that businesses are responsible to help member states fulfill their human rights obligations to provide access to essential medicines. So finally, taking two A and B together with three A and B entail that to fulfill their responsibilities, businesses are required not to impede member states in fulfilling human rights obligations generally, but specifically obligations to make essential medicines available to poor communities, especially the global south. Impediments um, might include pricing EM out of reach of poor communities or other activities, and for some practical advice on how to avoid doing that and fulfill these responsibilities, we'll come back to that on slide five. Before that, what I'd like to do is give a moral argument. Uh, the moral argument is that pharmaceutical companies have moral duties to act in socially responsible ways uh, in the home and host countries within which they operate. And we're gonna use uh, the notion of uh, a social contract. So corporations existence is made possible by society. Uh, this is something that I think sometimes gets forgotten, uh, but the two have not just legal, but social contracts. And here the idea of a social contract is drawn from the work of John Locke, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, Thomas Hobbes, among others. And the contract constitutes a relationship of dependence and trust between business and society. The next step is that multinational businesses, including pharmaceutical corporations of particular relevance here, thus enjoy various rights and privileges in both home and host countries. Uh, businesses are incorporated and operate in home countries, permitted to operate in host countries, and the US and elsewhere have legal personhood, et cetera. And then finally, in return, corporations are accountable to society, not always held accountable in the ways we might want as business ethicists, but they are accountable to society and they have contractual moral duties to operate in ways that benefit society, at least to some degree, including human rights responsibilities. And here I'm gonna draw on previous work by Michael for our definition of a human right. To call something a human right is to say that it imposes duties upon others across national borders to honor that right. Human rights are moral rights and human rights exist regardless of whether a particular uh, national government in actuality protects those rights. Of course, this raises a host of questions, uh, but to answer those questions is, is uh, will explain why we why I give both the previous argument and this argument. Uh, who owes what to whom? Uh, what responsibilities or duties do businesses owe specifically, and to whom and to what degree? And we take it those questions are answered in significant part by the argument from the previous slide on the UN Declaration Principles and Guidelines. Uh, I wanna wrap up with some uh, challenges and some solutions. Um, despite deriving these responsibilities and requirement 
uh, and obligations from international agreements relating to the UN, there is nevertheless limited enforceability and moral shortcomings of that uh, combination. These are not hard law, right? They're declarations, guidelines, principles. And because of what they are, at least partly because of what they are, they're in, and also of how they are phrased, right? We did a lot of argumentative gymnastics to come up with a requirement, but the individual statements are typically relating to business phrased in terms of uh, responsibilities, oughts or shoulds, and not obligations or requirements. And so uh, they are, you can say they don't have a whole lot of moral bite or maybe not as much moral bite as some of us would like. Next, uh, and very importantly, there are competing responsibilities. Uh, for the most part, these are, these are corporations. They have duties to return profits. And given the, the most of the world's economic background environment, uh, it's necessary to have financial rewards to motivate and uh, achieve the vaccines in the first place. If you didn't have some sort of uh, financial motivation and reward, we wouldn't even be having this discussion or at best it would be highly academic. Uh, so those uh, responsibilities have to be balanced with the human rights responsibilities and requirement we just uh, discussed. Um, if drug companies do make COVID-19 vaccines and other treatments more affordable in the global south, uh, they might enjoy some reputational benefits, but given the number of people affected by COVID-19 taken together with the costs of developing and pr pr uh, producing vaccines, make it more than likely that providing such help will result in lower profitability. So therefore we think uh, that human rights responsibilities can't amount to the equivalent of a blank check. Um, and so I'll wrap up with some ways for companies to fulfill the responsibilities and requirements based on uh, what we've seen in the past and learned from uh, in part, large part, HIV AIDS pandemic. So the first way in which companies can strike this balance is by donations through multi-stakeholder initiatives. And a good example is Merck's participation in the MASA or New Dawn program of the African Comprehensive HIV AIDS Partnership. This is a public-private partnership among the Republic of Botswana, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Merck Foundation. And thanks in significant part to them, Botswana became the first African nation to implement widespread distribution of antiretroviral drugs through its public health system. Next, differential pricing. Drug companies can still profitably sell drugs through differential or discounted pricing. Uh, whereby global North countries and wealthy individuals pay more, sometimes substantially more, for a medicine than underprivileged individuals and in global South uh, countries. Uh, here again, the HIV AIDS era provides examples. Um, uh, Antiretroviral medications that sold for 10 to 15,000 per patient per year early on in global North countries were after a time selling for 350 per patient USD per patient per year in the global South. And then finally, the relaxation of patent rights, especially in the global south. Um, this can be implemented in a variety of ways, including voluntary licensing, uh, shortening the duration of a patent and so on, but by relinquishing patent rights for sales in underprivileged jurisdictions, innovative drug companies can in effect speed up the rate at which less expensive generic medicines become available. So as a quick recap, uh, UN member states are obligated to prevent and remedy human rights violations in their jurisdictions. Businesses, especially in UN member states, have human rights responsibilities uh, to make EM available to poor communities, including in the global south. Uh, innovating pharmaceutical corporations in fulfilling those responsibilities are required not to interfere or impede member states in discharging their obligations. And on the grounds of social contracts that permit the existence of corporations in the first place, the responsibilities and requirement businesses face are moral as well. And there are indeed practical ways to balance human rights responsibilities with competing duties to return profits and the current need uh, and for the foreseeable future, the need for financial motivation as well as reward for the innovation that gets us the vaccines in the first place. And thank you very much. That's what I have to say. Thank you so much, Robert, for that theoretical contribution to our understanding of pharmaceutical companies' obligations, both legal and moral, and for a look at the COVID case in particular, blending theory and practice. We'll now turn to Zane. Thanks, everyone. Um, let me just start by sharing my screen. Oh, I think, Robert, you might need to stop sharing. There we go. Let's 
So thanks, everyone. My name is uh, Zane Rizvi. I work at a consumer organization called Public Citizen based in Washington, DC. And I thought what I'd do with my 20 minutes, let me just set a timer, is talk a little bit, I guess, provide some of the, the descriptive analysis of what is going on and, and perhaps suggest a way forward um, on what can be done about vaccine access. So this is the state of play, I believe, as of last week. We are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we have these incredibly effective vaccines that have come online and access is limited. And in fact, it is, it is limited, I guess, is an understatement in some way. We are facing what you know, the Director General of the World Health Organization called um, a moral catastrophe because even though the pandemic has, you know, devastated entire, you know, the entire global community, vaccine access is limited right now, especially to a handful of countries. Um, and those countries are primarily rich countries. Those countries are um, in a place where they will be able to end the pandemic much sooner and much quicker than practically everyone else. Um, there have been some initiatives at the global level. So you see COVAX, for example, which is one of the, the leading equitable access initiatives to help uh, distribute vaccines equitably. You'll see that the African Union has, has purchased uh, a, a number of vaccines, although the delivery date remains unclear. But for the most part, the top level analysis here is that Vaccines are online and they are clearly <laughs> inequally distributed. And what's remarkable here is that just the, the degree of inequity, right? Because it's not just a matter of months, it's actually a matter of years. Um, and with new variants and with new pressure on, 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 on demand and increasing supply, some of these figures might actually be underestimating the source of delay. Um, you can see large parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, may not get access for years. Um, you can see uh, countries in South Asia, even Southeast Asia, really serious challenges when it comes to access to coronavirus vaccines. And this has consequences. <laughs> this has consequences. A, ser a senior European Union official recently warned that a failure to vaccinate can develop into a question of war and peace. Uh, a business group, the ICC, estimates the global economy could lose up to 9.2 trillion. The UN Secretary General in March of last year was saying that the coronavirus pandemic is the worst crisis since World War II. And so it is really an uh, unprecedented crisis in so many ways, especially when it comes to public health, at least in the past century. Um, the UN is also saying, for example, that it has follow on effects, right? The, the, the all kind of the development goals that edu on education, on health, uh, on economic development, all of those goals are being severely impacted and are um, being, if not reversed completely, then at least progress is being stop stopped uh, significantly. And I think one thing to highlight here, so we know the problem, right? The problem is a lack of access to vaccines. What makes, I would say, the problem into an injustice is really what vaccine production and what basically what medicine, what medicine production looks like in the 21st century. And so one critical thing to understand when it comes to medicines is that they're not like other goods because in many cases, if not all cases, the cost of production is actually a fraction of the actual cost or of the actual price that the originator cor corporation sells the medicine for. And the premium that is paid, you know, the monopoly price um, is actually rooted in intellectual property. It is the idea that we award corporations monopolies um, and we allow them to essentially control both supply and price 
or make decisions about, uh, about supply and price as a result of the monopoly. But what's interesting here, and perhaps I should include this in different, a different slide here, is that it's about knowledge and it's about information. And the information itself is what's extremely valuable. And the information itself is what um, drives so much of the injustice. Because if we know the vaccine recipe, right? If we know how to make the vaccine and if one corporation who is publicly funded gets, you know, builds on years of government funded research and then ends up inventing the vaccine recipe or, you know, co-discovers, co-invents the vaccine recipe with the, with, the, with the government, then what we're doing through intellectual property and through kind of, you know, commercial practices as they are, is that we are controlling the flow of that information, we're blocking the control of that information, and we're concealing that information in some way. And so as a result, what we're doing is we're actually, in some cases, not teaching the world how to make a vaccine, and in some cases, actually blocking the world from making their own vaccine. And that's really the, the fundamental issue here, because there are vaccine manufacturers all around the world, right? They're, they're making vaccines for different kinds of diseases, and they might not have the recipe for this new kind of vaccine. They might not have the recipe for this newest technology, for example, the mRNA vaccine, the messenger RNA, kind of the new uh, breakthrough in, in modern science. And they could be making those vaccines, um, you know, and this is where the Jefferson quote comes in finally, which is that Moderna and Pfizer could share the vaccine recipe. They could um, allow these corporations to start pumping out the vaccines just like they're doing, um, but they don't. Uh, and governments in many cases fail to require that they do, even as they give the corporations billions and billions of dollars. And what's, I guess, ironic about that especially is that in some cases, the companies themselves were taught how to make the vaccines. So what is called the Pfizer vaccine is actually really the BioNTech vaccine, right? The BioNTech is a, is a small company in Germany that made, uh, that, you know, invested, uh, for, for years in mRNA technology. And BioNTech taught Pfizer how to make the mRNA vaccine last year in February when they entered into a partnership with Pfizer. And so what you're seeing is this limited sharing, you know, based on commercial imperatives and not on public health needs. And what we need is actually much more robust sharing of this vaccine recipe, of this knowledge. And this is, uh, a slide, I apologize, it's, it's a bit hard to, to read because the writing is so small, but so we have the kind of informational, what I call the informational injustice. And then what makes it more egregious is that in many cases, the information about how to make the vaccine or the information about does the vaccine actually work, the information about how to run the clinical trials and, and the outcomes of the clinical trials, that was actually funded in large part, if not entirely, by governments, by, tax, by, by taxpayers, by you and me. And so this is you know, an analysis of, of some of the leading candidates. You look at Moderna, J Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, Novavax, Pfizer, Sanofi, and you're seeing these eye-popping numbers, right? You're seeing billions and billions of dollars. Uh, you're seeing 2.5 billion for Moderna, which includes the purchase of the dose, but just one, 1 billion straight up just for R&D. Um, you're seeing AstraZeneca Oxford, 1.6 billion just from the US government alone. And then other initiatives also have put in money. Uh, Johnson & Johnson is 50-50 US government uh, split with the corporation R&D, like that's part of the agreement. And so if the US government is putting in half the money for research and development of these vaccines, then it would, you would think that the US government, you know, has some say about how these vaccines are priced and how they are supplied and how the technology that is funded is shared uh, uh, with the world. But unfortunately, that is not the case. And this is, I guess, the most um, troubling in the case of NIH Moderna, because it is called the Moderna vaccine when in fact it is the NIH Moderna vaccine. Uh, and the NIH here refers to the National Institutes of Health, which is one of the leading uh, US government institutions that works on biomedical research and development. And what we found is that the US government has played a critical role in the development of this vaccine. 
much more so than even out any other vaccine. And this is because federal scientists were actually involved every step of the way. Federal scientists were working with Moderna to invent the vaccine. They, were, they, they came up with a sequence, for example, for the mRNA, for the vaccine itself. They tested the vaccine. They were run, NIH scientists, public scientists were running the clinical trials. Uh, public, sci public scientists and public funding went into the clinical trials. And so despite this, and here's an example, you know, we found something in the contract about uh, Moderna and, and Moderna's contract with the US government agency called VARDA. And we found that Moderna actually had an obligation to disclose how much money it was getting from the US government and what, uh, how much of the project was funded by the US government and other uh, public funders. And this is an example of, you know, the lack of transparency and even though some actors are clearly calling for it, including you know, some US government officials and former officials. But what we found is that the US government for the project uh, and the project was, was, was defined as covering basically from phase two to all the way to uh, uh, development and manufacture. That project was 100% funded by the US government. And then we know from pub the public records, the US government also ran the phase one clinical trial and also did some of the preclinical work. And so you have preclinical US government, phase one US government, and then phase two on completely US government. <laughs> so this is a story of a vaccine that has benefited enormously from public funding, from uh, these enormously lucrative contracts with government. And the outcome of this is that Moderna has sold the, it's the vaccine, the NIH vaccine, the NIH Moderna vaccine for some of the highest prices that we know. Of. Uh, that is 32 to $37 per dose in low volume agreements, according to Moderna. Um, that vaccine has largely been sold to rich countries. Um, there's like a, a, a number of, or a very limited number of exceptions. Uh, I, I believe Colombia recently, recently entered into an agreement for, for a few million doses. So you have this immense transfer of wealth, really, uh, in, with US government and public taxpayers paying to help develop this vaccine, paying to test the platform, um, and Moderna making the decisions about price and supply and how widely it shares its vaccine recipe. And so that, I think, is kind of symbolic of, 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 of of the situation we're in. And to be clear, I, I want to acknowledge that Moderna did make investments, right? Moderna did make investments in from, you know, many years it has been working on the underlying technology. It has helped, uh, you know, it has done with actually some public funding even in the beginning, uh, some early tests on different kinds of vaccines. And so that's not to say that, you know, the private sector has done nothing. But in the case of COVID-19 vaccines, especially, you can see the the heavy hand, you know, the predominant hand, I would say, of, of, of public funders. And so what can be done, you know, or what should be done? And this is, you know, one of the, one of the UN committees on human rights, which I thought I would include uh, given the focus on human rights here. But one thing that I was, thought was very striking here is the idea that, and this is gonna sound, you know, almost <laughs> too theoretical, but, Intellectual property, even the idea, right? The idea of intellectual property has, is a new concept in some way because what we're traditionally seeing as very disparate ideas of copyright and trademark and patents suddenly were, you know, through this rhetorical maneuvering became property and they became rights. Um, and what the UN committee is basically saying here is that actually intellectual property is a social product. Um, and there's a reason for that maneuvering because when you talk about property and rights, you're, you're really going to a different conception of what uh, patents mean and should mean, uh, rather than just some utilitarian function to help incentivize innovation. And so this is an excerpt from the Director General of the World Health Organization, and it echoes many of the, 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 the recommendations and, the, and, and what we see as the path forward, which is the idea that no one corporation can really supply the world. No, obviously no corporation has an incentive uh, nor the capacity really to take on this Herculean task. And so we need the, the governments to step in and the governments should 
help share technology, should help uh, waive any intellectual property barriers that may stand in the way. They should expand the number of manufacturers that are making these vaccines and ultimately actually build capacity uh, that we know we need in, in for, for future pandemics as well as this one. And I have, I think five minutes. So, so one thing I, I, I wanna touch on as well is that the system we have now is in large part, it reflects what happened about 30, 25 years ago in the World Trade Organization, so a Geneva-based institution. And at the World Trade Organization, and these are you know, the members of the World Trade Organization, at the World Trade Organization in 1995, there was an agreement called TRIPS. And this is called, it's the Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights. And you can tell it's <laughs> that they included the, phrase trade related because you might be tempted to wonder what do intellectual property rights have to do with trade? <laughs> so they, they sort of included that um, to, 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 to eliminate any suspicion. But the global trade architecture had been focused largely on tariffs and you know what we might customarily think of uh, trade between countries. Um, and then, then there was a, a movement largely led by um, some US-based large corporations like Pfizer to push what trade meant into areas of what's called regulatory harmonization. And which means how governments and how, uh, how governments really structure markets. And one very clear example of this is, is intellectual property. And so you had um, a group of large corporations who were uh, benefited from IP protections really push the US government and push international actors to codify a set of minimum standards for what international intellectual property law should look like. Intellectual property is national, but states, many states, WTO states have obligations to comply with that international intellectual property law. And so this slide shows you the membership of the World Trade Organization. Um, and with some very limited exceptions for least developed countries, nearly all these countries have an obligation to comply with the TRIPS agreement that I previously identified. And what's interesting here, of course, again, is to compare the standards that of international intellectual property law versus the reality of both vaccine access, but in some cases development, right? Um, because clearly intellectual property law is something that impacts all facets of development, um, including public health. And so you see the disparity of having one set of laws that are universally, uh, or one set of universal standards with the disparity of who gets vaccines and when they get vaccines. And so that is sort of, I would say the central contradiction of TRIPS um, because it is so unsuited to the needs of so many countries. And of course there are ways uh, in which the, you know, there are flexibilities, there are ways in which the law can be um, uh, used or uh, interpreted to help promote more public health safeguards. And some countries are doing that. Um, and the latest development in, in this is India and South Africa, for example, are, are calling a waiver, are calling for a, a waiver at the World Trade Organization related to intellectual property rights. And so we think the, va the waiver should be supported. And in addition to kind of the, the the, uh, the, in addition to stop, in, in addition to not only stopping uh, the waiver itself, we think the Biden administration actually has an opportunity to take a positive and affirmative role in helping expand, expand vaccine supply. And so this is, uh, in some way, a summary slide of everything I've talked about, which is that the world is in the midst of extreme vaccine inequality. Um, there are global initiatives to help increase vaccine access, but in large part, those initiatives are not sufficiently ambitious and they're important, uh, but you know, clearly not enough to meet the global need. Um, the vaccine 
scarcity in part is because of intellectual property and because of commercial practice that restricts um, the sharing of vaccine recipes and technology associated with the vaccine and associated intellectual property barriers. And finally, um, that, that there is a need to make sure that vaccines um, capacity really uh, is strengthened and retooled and repurposed so we can have as many vaccines as possible as quickly as possible. Thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Zine. And thank you so much for uh, contextualizing the recent history of COVID-19 vaccine development, as well as for contextualizing the stakes of not addressing the theoretical problems that Robert outlined. And now to sort of synth synthesize things and to put it all together, we'll uh, conclude with Michael. And just a quick note, I see the chat is getting, or the, the Q&A is getting, rather busy, not to worry, we will be delving into each of these in due course, just to answer the attendee who commented on the broken link. I believe it does work from this end, uh, try clicking on the blue part directly, or if you're copy pasting, uh, removing the parentheses I added, but not to worry, we will get into the Q&A in depth and Michael, uh, whenever you're ready. Michael, I believe we're not hearing you. Uh, could we trouble you to unmute? You Okay, I think that that does it. Thank you, uh, Isabel, and thank you everyone else uh, at Oxford for pu putting together this uh, event and uh, for the invitation to participate uh, in it. Uh, greetings, everyone, from sunny and beautiful Santa Clara, California this morning. Uh, the title of my lecture today is The Lessons of COVID-19 Vaccines for Progressive Utopians, a Modest Proposal for world government to coexist with free markets. I define progressive utopians uh, as people who work within the political and economic system to achieve progress on climate change, human rights, systemic racism, food security, immigration reform, and other worthy goals, hence our progressivism. I dare say that just about all of you joining this event are progressive utopians doing this good work. In our daily lives, we work at a steady incremental pace, and we try to make small positive impacts through our advocacy and scholarship. But in our dreams, we imagine the economic and political system radically transformed to create a just and verdant world, hence our utopianism. In the business and human rights field, which is the branch of progressive utopianism with which I am most familiar, there are a number of skirmishes being fought by progressive utopian lawyers. One is the guiding effort, one is the effort to turn the now decade old United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which Robert Shanklin described in his lecture, into a binding international treaty. Less grand but equally significant are other efforts by lawyers to turn such so-called soft law initiatives into hard law. One notable recent example is the European Parliament's consideration of a due diligence law requiring companies to monitor, identify, prevent, and remedy risks to human rights and the environment. What I wanna do in this presentation is to step back a bit and consider two questions. First, what are the broader goals of progressive utopians? And second, what has the COVID vaccine development and distribution process taught us about these goals? There are two big dreams progressive utopians share. Uh, the first, which I think uh, Zane embodied uh, very nicely in his talk, is economic progressivism, changing the economic system by replacing free markets and private property with government investment and government intervention in deciding what to produce and how to allocate scarce, scarce resources. The idea is an old one. The centrally planned economy of the Soviet Union was a rough first draft. The conceit is that today we possess more goodwill and we are more technologically advanced, so we can do the job better. This 2.0 21st century version will avoid the threats to human rights and freedom that accompany this model in the 20th century. We will eliminate the profit motive, bring down the prices of essential goods, such as medicines and vaccines, and make better decisions about what products to produce so as to be kinder to the environment and healthier and more wholesome to our citizens and more wholesome to our citizens. A second dream of progressive utopians is globalism, 
In its most raw, unalloyed form, this means global government. We imagine a borderless world governed by the United Nations instead of the United States and Europe and China. And we imagine it together with economic progressivism, political globalism, and a global state-run economy. Now, at this point, I feel compelled to explain my use of the word utopian, a word first invent, invented by Thomas More in the 16th century. Literally in Greek, utopus means nowhere or no place. And the related word utopus means a good place. So you get the idea. What I'm describing doesn't exist. It will possibly never exist. But there are good things associated with this thought experiment that can help us think about the present. I hasten to say all this because even in a post-Trump America first world, entertaining even utopian ideas about global government and the elimination of all private property could disqualify anyone from public office, such as the state of subtlety in modern political discourse. So here is the main argument I want to make in this lecture. Our experience with the discovery and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines has formed a kind of natural experiment in assessing our utopian dreams. And there is a clear cut result. Free markets and incentivized drug discovery are indispensable. However, no substantial global justice or environmental sustainability goals for that matter will ever be achieved unless we move toward global governance. My modest proposal to my fellow progressive utopians is thus to imagine a world with free markets and global governance. Note, I am not saying private enterprise should not be held accountable. Quite the contrary. I'm arguing that corporations and the like should be accountable to one global government rather than hundreds of smaller ones. Something I want to assure my progressive utop economic utopian friends, most business people will not very much like. First, let us consider what just happened. The pharmaceutical industry, the industry that many, often for very good reasons, love to hate, delivered nothing short of a miracle. In less than a year, when the normal time for vaccine development can take up to a decade, they discovered and produced COVID-19 vaccines that have extraordinary safety and efficacy profiles. The private pharmaceutical companies, well-established giants like Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca, and relative newcomers like Moderna and Novavax, produced miracles and delivered us from our despair. Just as they developed antiretroviral treatments a generation ago, to combat the scourge of HIV AIDS, pharmaceutical companies created hope to cure our despair. It should be noted that unlike in the HIV AIDS era, these companies have learned they don't need to price gouge to make sufficient profits to replenish their innovation pipeline. As Zane very nicely described, governments certainly were a, a very big part of producing this miracle, providing the capital to enable vaccine discovery and, and by prepaying for dosages. Vaccine development, even when there is an important medical need, is fraught with too much uncertainty to develop optimally with only private capital investment. And academic scientists and universities, most notably here at Oxford, certainly provided much of the basic research. But the pharmaceutical industry did everything else. I would further argue, with apologies to the academic scientists at Oxford and elsewhere, that everything else contained the hardest bits. The ability to design and conduct rigorous testing protocols involving tens of thousands of patients across multiple global regions required a vast reservoir of institutional knowledge and capacity. The same might be said of the ability and know-how to manufacture, store, and distribute vaccines. It might seem like a bitter pill, but progressive utopians need to concede that one big lesson of COVID-19 vaccine discovery is that free markets and private enterprise worked. It would be foolish to kill the golden goose of private industry. I, for one, am not ready to jettison the innovative and technical capabilities of the pharmaceutical industry when, as is inevitable, the next pandemic, perhaps even scarier than this one, rears its ugly head.
While the COVID vaccine experience should work to temper the enthusiasm for progressive utopians to rein in free markets, it is a stark reminder that we need to redouble our other dream, global governance. What we have learned from the rollout of COVID-19 vaccine scenes is that vaccine nationalism and our own desperation thwart our better angels who would act with greater equity and justice for the rest of the world, especially for billions of poor citizens in the global South. The most basic moral principle, at least in the Western ethical tradition, is to love your neighbor as you would love yourself. It's, it's easy to say, but actually a very hard standard uh, to live up to as all of you with neighbors well know. In legal terms, this ethical principle forms the bedrock of equality under the law. People in poor countries decidedly do not have any chance of equality of access to COVID-19 vaccines because we in rich countries, in our fear and desperation, are hoarding vaccine supply. The European Union attempted to impose export restrictions on vaccines produced within its borders. The United States has locked up 1.5 billion doses while the European Union has locked up 2 billion, each far more than necessary to vaccinate their entire populations approximately twice over. Canada has reserved nearly five doses per Canada, capita and the UK and Australia near, nearly three per capita. Uh, Danilo, if you could uh, please show the, the slide uh, for everyone that I had prepared. Um, apart from hoarding, rich countries have been stingy with financial aid that would support drug manufacturing and distribution to the global south. The United States and Europe have made but meager contributions to COVAX, the World Health Organization initiative to ensure rapid and equitable global access to COVID-19 vaccines. Overall, COVAX has received less than a third of the 38 billion it targeted for release effort, relief efforts. This chart, uh, which is less detailed than the information Zane presented in his talk, demonstrates the stark reality countries in the global south, to the extent they will receive any COVID vaccines at all, will receive vaccines that are easier to transport and store, which makes sense given the capabilities of their healthcare delivery systems. However, as the chart also shows, they will get only the cheaper, less effective, and often unproven vaccines developed in India, China, and Russia. Consider the simple and sensible entreaty of WHO spokesperson Margaret Harris to the BBC. She said, we want to see vaccines happening all around the world. We want to see vaccination of health workers, older people in every country. So we're asking every country to focus on prioritizing those groups. Uh, you can take that slide down now, Danila. Listen also to the words of Yagen Shapagen, the Secretary General of the International Federation of the Red Cross. Almost 70% of vaccines so far have been sent to the 50 richest countries in the world, with just 1% of vaccinations going to the 50 most impoverished country. This is alarming because it's unfair and because it could prolong or even worsen the pandemic. Let me be clear, in the ra race to end this pandemic, we are all rowing in the same boat. We cannot sacrifice those at highest risk in some countries so that those at lowest risk can be vaccinated in others. Quite simply, Harris and Shapigan are asking that Europe and the United States treat the rest of the world as part of the same moral universe that our own citizens inhabit. Let me be, let me be clear, it is not just an ethical. It is not to love your neighbor, your neighbor as you love yourself, to vaccinate everyone in rich countries first, and then and only then to start to vaccinate the most vulnerable and essential workers in the global South. Put simply, and in the moral parlance of our time, global South lives matter. It is only our tribalism and sense of entitlement that stand in the way of acknowledging our global moral responsibilities. 
because we are in our nation state silos, we will never act morally in distributing essential medicines. Only a global government would offer the possibility of doing so. From a legal perspective, another troubling development is that rather than speaking in the language of human rights, many pitch the importance of rich countries contributing to COVAX, for example, in the corporate speak of enlightened self-interest. That is, rich countries should help poor and disenfranchised people in the global South, not because they have the human right to healthcare, but rather because it will lower our own GDP if they don't. From a moral and ethical perspective, this is about as baseless an argument as can be made. The simple fact is that in 2021, we are too scared and too tribal to achieve our most cherished ideals of global justice. The COVID-19 vaccine experience has shown us that the nation state system will never count and consider the rights of citizens in the global South on an equal footing with the rights of citizens in rich countries. This may be an inescapable real politique of our post-Westphalia nation state system, but it is a monumental moral and human rights failure. In conclusion, I would argue that what we have learned from the COVID-19 vaccine discovery process is that as distant and unattainable, as utopian, as a system of global governance may seem, this is where progressive utopians need to devote our efforts. The pharmaceutical industry produced the miracles we desperately needed. They have enabled privileged people in rich countries to emerge from our basements and Zoom meetings. Soon we will be drinking at pubs, eating in restaurants, and enjoying live entertainment. Our lives will start to return to normal but it will be years before the same can be said of our fellow human beings in the global South. Free markets did not fail us morally. Private enterprise did not fail us. Tribal nationalist governments failed us. We can and should change our economic system to make it more just and accountable. But the most important lesson of COVID-19 vaccine development is that our primary emphasis should be on moving toward a global government that can equitably and sustainably oversee and manage the abundant fruits that free markets and private enterprise make possible. Thank you.